Well, let's start at the very beginning, because as Julie Andrews told us, that's a very good place to start. <laughs> Michael, when you first read about Kuru in the Adelaide Advertiser, as we heard there, what did you think you might find when you, when you eventually went to PNG? Well, I had no idea, but, and it was some time before I went there. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Nori Robson, who was the professor of medicine at the time, and acknowledge his daughter, who's in the audience. Uh, he was wonderful to me. He'd been in, in uh, <coughs> Okapri, he'd seen cases, he'd come back. There'd been some activity generated in Adelaide, but there wasn't <coughs> much ongoing uh, work, and they had no particular ideas. And when a mere medical student <coughs> stood up and said he wanted to go and work on it, I was so excited by the idea because I wanted to get out of Adelaide and get out of <laughs> meds, traditional medicine anyway. Uh, I would have gone, I don't know what I would have done, but anyway, this was just perfect. So, and uh, Nori was wonderful. He supported me all the way. Um, and uh, we, he'd organized with Henry Bennett, who was a professor of genetics, uh, uh, a, a Rockefeller <coughs> Fellowship for, for Bob Glass and Shirley Glass, now Shirley Lindenbaum, to go up. And he <coughs> also organized one for me. Uh, so I was going to go on a fellowship. In the end, I went uh, as a medical officer in the uh, administration. And he uh, supported that as well. So I got a lot of support. But of course, <coughs> during this time, nothing much had happened in terms of new information about Kuru. So I just followed um, my own bent and um, ended up there. I really didn't have any idea what was going to happen. So between 1957, when you first heard about it, to 1961 was the yeah, time you actually yeah, arrived there. So yeah. what was the plan of action when you hit the ground? Oh, well, I was going to work, look, work on, as, as the film said, I was going to work on the clinical aspects, try and follow patients from beginning to the end. And in fact, that was the first time it had been done because Carlton had been there. They'd seen a lot of cross sections. They'd seen patients at all stages of the disease, but they'd never followed an individual patient right from beginning to the end. And subsequently, it was never done. They were the only patients of the 50 patients that I recorded uh, who were followed from beginning to end. And that produced some interesting information because although it was a uh, cerebellar disease, which caused the incoordination and the staggering and the trem tremors. There, there were signs of, of virtually every motor sign in neurology appeared in a Kuru patient, but often very uh, transitorily. So a, a visitor would come and say, you must come and see this patient because it has an incredible clonus. So you just touch <coughs> the <coughs> tendon and the, 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 the whole limb goes shaking. Uh, you get there and, uh, two days later, and it's all gone. Mm. So these were these are transitory things, and, <clears throat> and and that could only be discovered by following patients from the beginning to the end. So that's the clinical side. Then there was the epidemiological side, and I was also interested in genetics. And subsequently, Carlton and I did a lot of work on genetics. We didn't really discover anything because we didn't have the proper tools then. And, and the interesting thing is, in the last few years, the most exciting things that have come out of Kuru, apart from our knowledge of the long incubation period, has been what's come out of the genetics work. So it sounds like in those early days that this idea that it was a psychosomatic illness was quickly thrown out the window. Yeah, that was quickly thrown out. I mean, it was never made sense mm. anyway. Um, but, well, anthropologists have different view of the world from <laughs> And they win fewer prizes, as we heard there. So, well, well let's talk about cannibalism. Was, was that something that you knew about? Was it, was it something that was widespread at the time that you arrived there? Well, when I, when I went there, it had, it had stopped. And in fact, um, <clears throat> hadn't quite stopped, because when I was in the village, we heard surreptitious reports uh, that <clears throat> came through various means uh, of uh, cannibalism that had taken place. Uh, by, but it was only older women that dug up bodies and that, because they'd, they'd been unhappy about the way they'd been treated. 
Now, I must emphasize that I don't use the term cannibalism anymore to describe this practice. I use the word transumption, and I've been doing that for the last 12 years. What does that mean? And that, that is, that's the, <coughs> the mortuary practice of consumption of the dead <coughs> and incorporation of the, of the body of the dead person into the living bodies of relatives, uh, and thus freeing the spirit of the dead, because it was in a very important way that enabled <coughs> the, the spirit of the dead person to most efficiently reach the land of the ancestors. And we're now learning much more about this. And it took, it took 20 years, probably, of living in a community, becoming a part of that community, before people started opening up about these secret practices and, and, and sharing their cosmology and their religious beliefs, which previously had been hidden. And when the anthropologist asked about it uh, in the first place, uh, they were told, we ate because the meat tasted delicious. Which is true, but that wasn't. <laughs> but that wasn't the real reason. And of course, the whole body was eaten. I mean, the meat was delicious, but the feces and the <clears throat> uh, and the hair <clears throat> and the bones. I mean, you know, that, that was a bit of a struggle to consume all that. <laughs> but it, it was done, and the women did it. <laughs> mm. I must say, it was very uncomfortable, as I'm sure some of you uh, view, some of you might share, watching the elders talk about the consumption of human flesh and to hear the female elder there saying human flesh tastes very sweet. That's a very uncomfortable thing to hear. Did your attitude towards eating human flesh change from the time that you got there to the time that you sort of more fully understood the, the local culture? Oh, I think it did. When I, well, when I first went there, the other thing one could say is that um, if you talk to people in the bar, <coughs> They'd say, oh, you're, going, you're working on Kuru. Oh, that's <clears throat> all those four people out there. They're all bloody cannibals, and that's why they get Kuru. So I mean, it, the, the idea that cannibalism was the <clears throat> associated with Kuru wasn't an idea that we had to discover. I mean, what we had to do was to fit it in <clears throat> to the puzzle. And this was the sort of glib explanation for the disease from in bar talk. Um, and I guess my attitude was you know, based on what <coughs> any, anyone growing up in Australian society would think. I mean, it was an abhorrent practice. But <coughs> when I learned more about it and got... And I was, I was given some information more than what, to the, you know, what was reported in, in, in publications. I began to understand that this had much more significance than <clears throat> just because meat tasted good. But was, it took a long time before we got the full story. And so my attitude to the practice has changed over a long period as I, begun, as I began to understand more and more about it. Mm -hmm.